Yep, still a universe of water. Water is, as I hope I outlined in my still ongoing video series on the topic, remarkable stuff. A single droplet, even one taken from your home tap, will, when placed under a microscope, reveal a jungle of life. As the now somewhat tired saying goes, wherever there is water, there is life. As long as conditions exist, even for the barest trace of water to remain liquid, some form of life will exploit it. And we now know our solar system, and the universe for that matter, to be brimming with water. I would say overflowing, but water just freezes when exposed to space, so not going to happen. New water sources outside our dank planet are always cause for excitement. And this year, we found water in all manner of soggy crannies. In November, the poster child for extraterrestrial water, Jupiter's moon Europa, finally revealed what astronomers have been waiting to see since they first glimpsed its surface 40 years ago. Using the iconic Keck Observatory in Hawaii, an international team of NASA-backed researchers identified water above Europa's surface, indicating that the moon, like Enceladus, periodically erupts geysers of water from beneath its global ice cap. While this isn't a clincher for the ocean long thought to exist in Europa's depths, it will take the long-awaited Europa Clipper mission, scheduled for launch in 2024, to do that. It is as close as we've come to actually seeing said ocean with our own eyes. In June, a team from Caltech identified what may be the second component of that shadowy sea. Salt. As in, everyday common table salt. Using the Hubble Space Telescope, they observed infrared traces of salt on Europa's leading hemisphere, the side perpetually facing Jupiter. Europa's leading hemisphere is protected from the constant rain of sulfur and other materials flowing from Jupiter's ill-tempered inner moon, Io, which means that the salt is unlikely to have been deposited from elsewhere. That, and the fact that the salt was found amid so-called chaos terrain, a mass of broken ice believed to have been disrupted by tectonic processes, suggests that the salt is endogenic and that Europa's ocean may be very much like our own. That isn't to say that Europa's brash little cousin, Enceladus, didn't push for the limelight again this year. The Cassini mission may have ended spectacularly in 2017, but the 650 gigabytes of data it transmitted in 13 years around Saturn will take decades to fully decipher. In October, a team led by Nozair Koaja of Berlin's Free University by trolling through the records of Cassini's cosmic dust analyzer, were able to identify traces of nitrogen and oxygen-bearing compounds that could be the precursors of amino acids, building blocks of proteins. Such compounds are not rare in space. Meteorites are loaded with them. But combine them with liquid water and you have yourself a nice warm bowl of primordial soup. And that primordial soup may be yummier than we first suspected. In June, a study by Lucas Pfeiffer and colleagues at the University of Washington suggested that the data obtained from Cassini's epic sweeps through Enceladus's plumes may be misleading, since plumes sort their contents by weight as they ascend, leading to skewed percentages. By accounting for this so-called fractionation, Pfeiffer et al. have suggested that Enceladus's ocean may actually possess far more hydrogen, methane, and carbon dioxide than initially believed. Hydrogen and methane are both potential food sources for microbes, and carbon dioxide would make Enceladus's ocean more acidic, which, while not a good thing for our ocean, may actually make Enceladus's more habitable, as initial calculations have suggested it was exceptionally alkaline. But with the addition of carbonic acid, its pH level could be far more similar to Earth's. Europa may have to doll itself up if it doesn't want its crown stolen. In my first video in the water series, I noted how deuterium, a rare isotope of hydrogen, could be used to fingerprint sources of water. Our planet's oceans contain water with a hydrogen deuterium ratio of 157 parts per million. Since the ocean is believed to have formed thanks to the impacts of icy cometary bodies, it was hoped that, once the chemical composition of comets could finally be studied, they would show similar isotope ratios. But they didn't. Every comet's isotope ratio was completely different from every other, and only one, partly too, showed any similarity with Earth's ocean. But evidence found this year suggests that we may have been going about this all wrong. In May, 
A team at the Paris Observatory analyzed data from SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, basically an infrared telescope stuck onto an airplane, and thus happily above all that pesky infrared-absorbing water. In 2018, SOFIA had imaged Comet Vertinen, one of an exclusive club of comets dubbed hyperactive, because they appear to emit more material from their surfaces than should be possible. This is due to the fact that hyperactive comets expel not only vapor from their surfaces, but gobs of ice blasted out from their interiors. Thus, their atmospheres, unlike those of more mundane comets, represent a pristine sample of their makeup. Hartley II, as it happens, is a hyperactive comet, and the study revealed that Zwirtnen, like Hartley II, possessed a deuterium ratio similar to that of Earth's oceans. It seemed that the purer the sample we got of a comet's composition, the more like Earth's oceans that comet became. Perhaps the future will show that the relationship between comets and our planet is closer than we thought. But it's not just the comets that share a kinship with our world. In May, a team at Arizona State University analyzed a few tiny grains returned from an asteroid in 2010. For several years, Japan's largely unsung Hayabusa program has been sending probes to main belt asteroids, sampling their surfaces, and then returning them, unspoiled, back to our curious planet. Or at least it's done so once. We'll have to wait till later this year to see if the second one makes it back in one piece. The precious sample that the first Hayabusa returned to Earth has been carved away grain by minuscule grain and scattered to the far ends of our planet. After bombarding the two 40 micron sized fragments with highly charged ions, the Arizona team were able to determine that not only was the asteroid far wetter than expected for its orbit, but that the water within was very similar to Earth's. Perhaps our ocean is not such a freak, after all. Oh, and before I move on, I should mention K218b, a Neptune-sized planet found in the Kepler catalog, which this September was found by both the Hubble and Spitzer Space Telescopes to possess water in its atmosphere. It is not the first exoplanet known to have water, but it is the first to be located within its star's habitable zone, thus ticking two of the three boxes for the holy grail of exoplanetology. The third, an Earth-like mass, seems only a matter of time. I'll be keeping the list top slot open for 2020. Did we just colonize the moon? The great thing about private funding is that it opens doors to possibilities beyond the comprehension of any sane government. This April, when Bereshit, the first ever privately funded lunar lander, unexpectedly crashed onto the moon's surface, it may have inadvertently exceeded its mission goals. The word Bereshit has nothing to do with the woods, but is in fact the Hebrew name for the book of Genesis, a nod to Space IL, the Israeli organization that conceived and launched the probe. Its primary mission goals were study the moon's magnetic field and precisely measure the Earth-Moon distance. More secondarily, it was to act as a time capsule for life on Earth, and included a holographic representation of over a thousand books, including Asimov's Foundation Trilogy and a complete download of Wikipedia, along with various translation codes in case English was a dead language by the time it was found. The materials were visually micro-projected onto a nickel disk readable by any microscope of 1,000 times magnification or more, thus avoiding any formatting issues. The library was the brainchild of the Arch Mission Foundation, which has placed many such archives across the Earth and solar system, including one in the glove compartment of Elon Musk's flying Tesla, so that they might serve as records of our civilization should we be, well, human enough to end it ourselves. But alongside the data library, the foundation, for whatever reason, decided to place a biological sample as well, including a racially diverse sample of human DNA and a few live tardigrades, curious little creatures that resemble chubby insects but are only distantly related. Tardigrades are quite possibly the most resilient multicellular life forms on the planet, able to completely dehydrate themselves, replacing their body fluids with protein and entering an extreme form of hibernation known as cryptobiosis. This enables them to survive hours, days, and even years in conditions that would kill any other form of life, including inside volcanic springs, at the very bottom of the ocean, and even in space, 
In 2007, a Russian mission to low Earth orbit exposed a sample of tardigrades to the lack of elements for ten whole days. More than half of them survived. Some of the poor buggers even managed to hold out for a few minutes after being brought down to one degree above absolute zero. Quite what the Foundation intended to accomplish with these tardigrades is not entirely clear. Any future culture advanced enough to retrieve the data cache would likely have plenty of tardigrades of its own. Perhaps they were intended for a culture of tardigrade descendants. Regardless, the tardigrades have now been spattered across the lunar surface and have become the first ever lunar life forms, an inadvertent and likely short terrestrial colony. Though if these newly lunar tardigrades ever manage to find any of the hundred or so baggies of human poop left there by the Apollo astronauts, we might have a surprise waiting for us upon our eventual return. While I call these creatures the first lunar life forms, they may well not be. Earth and the moon have been swapping rocks for billions of years. There are asteroids from the moon on Earth, and asteroids from Earth on the moon. Any one of these pea shots could have deposited a tardigrade or two on the lunar surface. So perhaps the tardigrades themselves have a surprise waiting for them. NASA isn't all that concerned about this. Its planetary protection protocols, yes, those are a thing, do not apply to the moon, which is regarded as devoid of indigenous life. Had this happened on Mars, or, God forbid, Europa, things would have been a lot more complicated. I should say that, for all the fantasizing I've just indulged in, those poor tardigrades are very likely dead. But if you instead want to imagine that they thrived and made a home, you can take a glimmer of hope in the study performed in July by a team at the Arecibo Observatory that suggested the moon may be more watery than we initially thought. The team had concluded a survey of Mercury's craters and found that the closer they were to the poles, the shallower they tended to be. This suggested that polar craters were cold enough to be filled to the brim with ice. This year they conducted a similar survey of 12,000 craters on the moon and saw a similar pattern. This suggested that the total amount of ice on the moon could be as high as 100 million metric tons, double the originally calculated amount, and about as much as a fair-sized lake. Exomoons! Maybe. In my previous year's compilation, I listed the possible discovery of Kepler-1625b1, the first potential exomoon, as one of the great moments in astronomy along with my complaints concerning its offensively unmoonlike qualities. Seriously, it was the size of Neptune. What moon does that? Anyway, looks like my sensibilities were rightly offended, because thanks to the great, if vastly underappreciated, scientific task of double-checking, it seems that that bloated monstrosity of a moon does not, in fact, exist, and was most likely a bug in the team's calculations. To their credit, the team were very gracious at being found wrong, and admit the new results warrant further observations. So with that one out of the running, are there any new candidates for the first ever observed exomoon? Well... In July, an Australian-led team used the redoubtable telescope array known as ALMA, with its unparalleled perch in the Atacama Desert, to find a swirling disk of dust around PDS-70C a still-forming gas giant in orbit around the baby star PDS-70. It is a mere 10 million years old. In the constellation Centaurus. This marks the first ever observation of a circumplanetary disk. While every moon's history is unique, we've managed to suss out three broad scenarios for their formation. The first is capture. Planet's gravity simply pulling a moon into orbit around it. This is harder than it seems because it requires something else to slow the prospective moon down before it can enter orbit, and so it is unlikely to be the origin for many large moons. Many small moons, such as Phoebe, and one large moon, Triton, are believed to have formed this way, however. The second option is collision. Either two bodies collide and then break apart again, or two bodies collide and, out of the resulting debris, a third body forms. This is believed to have been the origin of our own moon as well as a Pluto's moon Charon. But the final and most cosmologically pleasing option is co-formation. Moons forming around a planet out of a spinning disk of gas and dust, just as the planets are believed to have formed around the Sun. The moons of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus 
are all believed to have formed in this awesome fashion. But until now, no evidence of such formation had been found. But in PDS 70C, we seem to have caught a prospective retinue of moons at the moment of birth. So even if we have yet to definitively locate an exomoon, at least we can rest assured that we will have one in a few million years. In August, another possible exomoon was proposed by a Swiss-led team to be lurking like a ghost in the spectra of WASP-49b, a not-quite-Jupiter-sized planet discovered in 2011 by WASP, or the Wide Angle Search for Planets, a planetary transit survey that has been running since 2006. In 2017, an envelope of sodium was found surprisingly high above 49b's atmosphere, which the Swiss team noticed bore a striking resemblance to another in Jupiter's atmosphere, created by its monster moon Io. Io is not a monster because it is particularly large. It is about the size of our own moon. Io is a monster because it endures the full torment unleashed by its gargantuan, callous parent. Its orbit is periodically tugged out of circularity by its fellow large moons, and as a result, the hideous gravitational force which Jupiter exerts on its fragile form varies causing its shape to distend like a melon in a vice. Perpetually on the verge of being torn asunder, only to be released again, Io howls cries of pain into the void in the form of gigantic volcanoes, one of which you can expect to be erupting on Io at any moment. If such a moon orbits WASP-49b, then we could expect it to be similarly tormented. The head of the team, Aperva Oza, called the prospective moon of WASP-49b a place where Jedis go to die, though in truth, Mustafar had nothing on Io. Ah, Tabby Star, will there ever come a year when we finally learn your secrets? I must say, if I cannot have you as home to a race of godlike planet shapers, then I prefer you as the evasive coquette you are. But even if you are not surrounded by an alien megastructure, the question of what you could possibly be surrounded by remains. Brian Metzger of Columbia University thinks he may have the answer. An exomoon. What, I hear you cry? A star orbited by a moon? Does that not break the laws of physics, or at least lexicography? But it isn't as far-fetched an idea as you might think. In July, a Colombian team modeled the behavior of exomoons around so-called hot Jupiters, Jupiter-sized planets that orbit their stars within the orbit of Mercury and discovered that any such moons would very likely be gravitationally thrown out of their orbits and sent into orbit around their sun, becoming what the team called plunets, or moon planets, a word I love, though it really should have been spelled like this. Mario Sukukia, the head of the Colombian team, suggested that the formation of plunets would explain why no exomoons have been found to date, since so many exoplanets found to date have been hot Jupiters. Jumping from Colombia back to Colombia, the team studying Tabby Star suggests that the broken, chaotic mass of material in orbit around it likely began its life in just such a situation. A hot Jupiter fell victim to its star's gravitational force, and the exomoons it possessed were sent spiraling into space. Most were either eaten by their star or fell into comet-like orbits, but some, about 10%, fell into orbit around their star. The moon's proximity to its star caused its icy outer layers to boil, creating a ring of obscuring dust, while larger particles fell into orbit around their dying moon, persisting for longer and causing long-term dimming. So, as of now, the number of confirmed exomoons still stands at zero. But as we shall see later on this list, in astronomy, things are only a matter of time. Another interstellar visitor. And it's unnervingly boring. Many often view the study of space as disconnected from our reality, but it arguably reshapes that reality more profoundly than any other discipline. In 1960, the other planets of our solar system were vague, indistinct dots. Now, they're selfie locations. In 1991, extrasolar planets were science fiction. Now their geography. And until two years ago, I doubt many people even gave much consideration to the idea that our solar system may play host to visiting objects from other stars, or at least natural ones. 
But when Oumuamua swept through our sun in October 2017, it not only forced humanity to cross yet another existential threshold, but confounded everyone by also being unutterably bizarre. It was seven times longer than it was wide, showed no coma or tail, and even seemed to accelerate as it moved away from the sun, exiting stage right with a raspberry to Isaac Newton. We still don't know how it did this. When even scientists have to double-check to ensure that a new object is not a spaceship, you are indeed courting the unknown. But then, on August 30th, 2019, the freak became a population. That day, a remarkable astronomer named Gennady Borisov, who maintains the telescopes of Moscow State University's Crimean Astronomical Station, but also possesses a personal observatory of self-constructed telescopes capable enough to be officially listed by the IAU, discovered his ninth comet, which, in keeping with tradition, was duly named Comet 2019 Borisov. Only a week after Borisov's discovery, a team in Jagiellonian University in Poland also stumbled across it, but for a completely different reason. After the relatively late detection of Oumuamua, they decided to catch the next interstellar visitor early, and to that end developed a piece of software called Interstellar Crusher to mine any newly discovered comets for orbital parameters suggesting interstellar origins. And lo, if Comet Borisov didn't fit those parameters like a glove. It was speeding around the sun at 49 kilometers per second, faster than Mercury, and fast enough at its distance to send it into interstellar space. Borisov was duly redesignated I-2 Borisov, and placed alongside Oumuamua in its still tiny club of interstellar objects. But beyond its trajectory, Borisov was no Oumuamua, an alien monolith of obscure structure and origin. It was a comet. Nothing more, nothing less. A bit on the green side, but not out of any norm for the solar system. It has a coma, a tail, and a spectrum broadly similar to any number of comets in our solar system. It even contains cyanide, the same substance that caused a worldwide panic when it was found in Halley's coma a century ago. And on March 28th, 2020, it crowned its monumental ordinariness by breaking apart. It probably now only exists as dust. And yet this comet's very mundanity indicates a profound truth. What is true for our solar system is true for everywhere else. The same materials that make up our solar system are forged in star systems across the universe. And comets, as I showed above, are reservoirs of the very materials of which we are composed. Borisov also hinted at another unnerving truth. The only aspect differentiating it from any other comet was its orbit. Without it, we would never have known that it was of interstellar origin. That suggests that our solar system may be riddled with interstellar comets, hiding in plain sight. In December, a team in Munich modeled 400 million interstellar comets as they came into contact with our solar system primarily the Sun and Jupiter. Thanks to the Gaia probe, they were able to use realistic velocities for their hypothetical objects, and plotted it using a supercomputer cluster and 70 graphics cards. The end result showed that, while the chances of capture are relatively small, roughly one per year for every 20 cubic AU, the resulting captured comets would then be on orbits indistinguishable from our locally sourced variety. This means that the solar system could be home to as many as a hundred thousand interstellar comets. If we ever learn a way to distinguish them, they could prove an invaluable clue as to the nature of our universe, and perhaps even the formation of life itself. Another model, constructed at the University of Zurich, suggested that such objects could be a natural part of solar system formation. Within the clusters in which stars form, stars push and jostle each other, irreparably altering their planetary systems. Every star is surrounded by a circumstellar disk of cometary objects, what in our solar system is called the Kuiper Belt. As the young stars pass in the night, their circumstellar disks come into contact, sending comets into interstellar space. Thus, according to this model, interstellar comets are not flukes. They are integral to the evolution of star systems across the universe, including our own. Mars's atmosphere gets lively. 
Did you know that Mars's atmosphere has oxygen in it? I didn't, at least not before compiling this list. But glance at the percentages and there it is. 0.174% oxygen. That's about one part in 575. Enough to fully aerate an area the size of South Korea to a height of one kilometer. Don't get too excited, though. The percentage is in line with the oxygen having formed from photolysis of carbon dioxide, i.e., the breaking down of carbon dioxide by ultraviolet radiation from the sun into atomic oxygen and carbon monoxide. Except, in November, a team from the University of Michigan released their analysis of atmospheric samples taken over the course of six years by NASA's redoubtable Curiosity rover, which has been trolling around Mars's Gale Crater ever since landing there in August of 2012. Well, I say six years. I really should say three, because Mars counts time at a much slower pace. In that time, Curiosity's onboard chemistry lab has continuously sampled the local air as it shifted and flowed with the slow Martian seasons. Mars's atmospheric pressure is only about 1% of Earth's, which means that even slight changes can produce striking results. It is also 95% carbon dioxide, and, since Mars cycles around carbon dioxide's freezing point over the course of its year, its polar caps wax and wane with seasonal additions of dry ice. In winter, as its air freezes to the ground, Mars's atmospheric pressure decreases and the relative abundance of gases other than carbon dioxide increases. In spring, frozen carbon dioxide evaporates, the air pressure increases, and the relative abundance of other gases decreases. For the three Martian years covered in the study, Mars's atmospheric mix behaved as expected, at least for its more obvious trace gases, such as nitrogen or argon, but not for oxygen. Every spring, Mars's atmospheric oxygen levels increased by 30%, far higher than should be possible before falling back to predicted levels come autumn. That it managed to disappear so quickly was, if anything, even odder. For photolysis to do that work would take 10 years. The finding was so baffling that the team even rechecked Curiosity's onboard instruments. They were fine. There is no known chemical process that could explain such a massive rise in oxygen levels. Well, uh, there is one, of course, but it will be a while before we can actually confirm it. Another fickle molecule that may or may not reveal the presence of life is, of course, methane. And in June, Curiosity caught a whiff of the single greatest release of methane ever recorded on Mars, three times the previous record. The vast majority of methane sources in Earth's atmosphere are ultimately biological in origin, either directly, such as through farming, or indirectly, such as through mining the natural gas released from decaying microorganisms. Although methane can remain in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, one of many reasons that, on our planet, make it such a potent greenhouse gas, on a geological scale, it's a fleeting wisp. This means that either the methane must be being continuously released or released only recently from an underground reservoir that may be billions of years old. Curiosity has detected such plumes in the past, but never at such intensity, and seldom so briefly. The burst was so brief that not one of the armada of orbiters that have been circling Mars for years managed to detect it. Even ESA's Mars Express, which had previously confirmed similar bursts detected by Curiosity, completely missed it, as did the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter which is capable of sniffing gases at parts per trillion. It's possible the result was obscured by dust in Mars's atmosphere, or by the fact that the plume was detected at night, which meant that it would have been held near the surface by the cold. It seems Mars will continue its habit of infuriating its intrusive Terran visitors until we muster the will to actually go there. Venus gets some love. Every year you can expect this list to host a stream of Mars discoveries, but Venus, our closest planet, is usually conspicuously absent. That changed this year, with a host of new discoveries thrusting Earth's wayward sister into the light. Venus is the most beautiful object in the sky. The sun will blind you, the moon is pockmarked, and no star can match Venus's golden glow. Since the dawn of civilization, Poets and minstrels have idolized its beauty. 
even granting it the name of the goddess of beauty herself. Come the space age, dreams of Cytherean splendor had transmuted to visions of tropical seas hosting primal leviathans under its ever-present clouds. But then we arrived, and her true nature was revealed. After the U.S.'s Mariner IV swiped the title of First to Mars in 1965, the Soviet Union decided that their planet would be Venus. Perhaps they thought they'd won the true prize. Mariner IV had revealed tiny Mars to be a moon-like cratered desert. The great canyons and volcanoes that give Mars its star appeal today wouldn't be discovered until Mariner 9 arrived in 1971. Venus, on the other hand, was the size of the Earth, closer, and covered with inviting clouds. Surely whatever was below would be a worker's paradise. In 1966, Venera III became mankind's first stumble into Venus's boudoir. It imploded before it reached the surface. In 1967, Venera IV actually managed to take some atmospheric measurements before it imploded. Venera VII, the USSR's third attempt at a Venus lander, actually did manage to land, though its parachute failed to open and it toppled over on impact, only surviving for another 23 minutes, but managing to measure a staggering surface pressure of 90 atmospheres at a temperature of 465 degrees Celsius. Much like Doomsday, each subsequent Venera probe evolved to counter what had destroyed its predecessor, until the monstrous bunker-like constructions lasted as long as two whole hours, even returning images from the surface. Though what we so briefly glimpsed through those metal eyes so horrified us that we wouldn't dare view it again for nearly twenty years. Magellan, which arrived at Venus in 1991, would be the last probe to see its face. Like the echoing, seemingly abandoned house at the end of your street, Venus has been left largely alone, and those few probes that have visited have restricted themselves to its golden-hued atmosphere. After all, once you've gazed upon hell, would you want to return? And yet, while we still have not sent new eyes to gaze upon its nightmare visage, this year did see a sudden uptick in interests in the second planet. It will never steal the limelight from Mars, but perhaps it bodes interesting for the future. For instance, in July, a team at the University of Wisconsin and the Technical University of Berlin conducted an intense survey of features known as dark absorbers, mysterious dark splotches that occasionally discolor Venus's upper atmosphere by absorbing incoming light from the sun, mostly in the ultraviolet but also slightly in the visible. Over time, they wax and wane, shifting Venus's albedo and energy level. These dark absorbers have been known for years and have been speculated to be anything from sulfur to ferric chloride to even microorganisms. This isn't wild speculation, either. Whatever particles comprise them do appear to be of similar dimensions to the microbes that make up Earth's aeroplankton. Whatever they may be, they can reduce the amount of energy reaching Venus's surface by half. This variation in sunlight would drastically affect Venus's weather patterns. By examining over a decade's worth of data from Japan's Akatsuki spacecraft, currently in orbit around Venus, ESA's Venus Express, which concluded an eight-year orbit of the planet in 2014, the Hubble telescope, and flybys from the Messenger Mercury orbiter, they were able to demonstrate that the dark absorbers reach a maximum coverage before fading away. Venus possesses little to no axial tilt, which means it has no seasons. For years, it was thought that Venus had no climate cycles at all, but the Wisconsin-Berlin paper suggests that perception is wrong. The paper notes that the period of maximum splotchiness, and thus lowest albedo, occurred roughly at the same time as the sun's sunspot maximum, suggesting that these dark absorbers may be linked to the sunspot cycle. If that is the case, then Venus could very well possess a regular climatic cycle, only one 11 years long. One of the dreams of Cytherian studies is that we may discover a time, any time, when the planet was less terrifying than it is today. Studies of water in the atmosphere had suggested that Venus may once have had an ocean, and various studies have also suggested that when our solar system was young, Venus might really have been the watery paradise once imagined by science fiction writers. This dream was dealt a blow this year, however, when, in August, a paper in the Journal of Geological Research examined Magellan data 
and found that one of the Venusian highlands, Obda Fluctus, was in fact a basaltic lava flow, rather than a granitic formation as had been previously thought. These lava flows are water poor, and so do not indicate a watery interior for the planet. Also in May, a paper in the Astrophysical Journal modeled the tidal force exerted on Venus's primordial ocean by the young sun, and showed that it could have brought Venus from an Earth-like rotation speed to its current 243 days in just 50 million years. Early models have suggested that a faster rotation for Venus could have moderated its climate by generating excess cloud cover. If this paper is correct, then Venus never had a chance for that to happen, meaning it was never a paradise. And yet, the dream lives on. In September, a team at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies modeled five simulations for an early Venus, each assuming varying amounts of ocean coverage. A deep ocean of 310 meters, a shallow ocean of just 10 meters, and a dry world with water trapped in the soil. They also modified their climate models to account for the sun's gradual increase in luminosity and the changing composition of the atmosphere. They found that, far from dying at birth, Venus could have maintained a stable temperature between 20 and 50 degrees Celsius for the majority of the age of the solar system, only succumbing to its fiery tomb about 700 million years ago, when Earth, ironically, was likely in a state of global glaciation. When Venus was first mapped by Magellan in 1991, Geologists noticed a curious fact about its craters. None appeared to be older than about 350 million years. The hypothesis to explain it was that Venus periodically underwent so-called global resurfacing events, massive, planet-wide simultaneous volcanism that wiped away any previous geological features. The Goddard team speculates that it was the outgassing of carbon dioxide from one such event that likely tipped Venus over the edge. Venus may be hell now, but, much like an abused boyfriend, we can find comfort in pondering how warm and nurturing she may once have been. Fresh Ice Every year or so, humanity sees something it has never seen before. In 2019, it saw two somethings. The second is my number one. The first, which came into view on the first day of 2019, was this object formerly designated 2014 MU69 and now called Arakoth, which was the stretch goal of the Pluto mission successfully completed by the New Horizons spacecraft in 2015. Arakoth is our first collective glimpse at a residual planetesimal, an unspoiled relic from the earliest ages of our solar system. Pluto had been the farthest flyby ever conducted by humanity, and now that honor belongs to Arakoth, which, at nearly 45 AU out, is half again as far as Pluto. The name Arakoth, meaning sky, is taken from the language of the Powhatan, the indigenous people of the area around Maryland, home to the Applied Physics Laboratory that headed the New Horizons mission. The object was formally named on the 12th of November 2019 in a traditional Powhatan ceremony at NASA headquarters. New Horizons' slow transmitter means that the findings from that encounter won't be fully downloaded until the summer of 2020, but a great deal has already been learned, which you can hear all about in my video on the subject, link in the description. post arakoth New Horizons will scan the Kuiper Belt for distant objects using its long-range reconnaissance imager, while waiting for its next, and likely final, target. Alan Stern, head of the New Horizons team, intends to begin the search for new targets in the summer, when New Horizons' portion of the sky comes out from behind the sun. Since I've already discussed this encounter in detail, let's look at some other fresh ice. The denizens of the IAU's Minor Planet Center are a dedicated lot. They work up to a hundred hours a week, noting and cataloging the thousands of reports of new solar system objects that come in each month. Official numbers are only assigned to those objects with secured orbits and we're coming up on half a million of those. The total number of kilometer-sized objects in the solar system runs into the millions, if not billions. And amazingly, in January, we actually caught a glimpse of one. If this should become a regular occurrence, God help the MPC. How is this accomplished, when such objects are beyond the power of even our best telescopes? By employing astronomy's most effective ghost catcher, occultation. Occultation is when an object in the solar system passes in front of a star, temporarily dimming its light. 
by staring intently at two thousand stars for a total of sixty hours the gloriously named organized auto telescopes for serendipitous event survey or oases a pair of small telescopes in okinawa japan managed to detect a single object about one point four kilometers long within the kuiper belt that they were able to do so in such a short time suggests that kilometer-sized objects are far more common in the Kuiper Belt than we initially thought. This next bit of news is not so much fresh ice as looking at old ice in a fresh way. In September, a team led by Gal Sarid of the University of Central Florida applied computer models to the orbit of 29P swashman vachman one which they sensibly shortened to the rather posh moniker SW1. As the attentive solar system watchers among you may note, the prefix P identifies SW1 as a periodic comet, alongside 1P Halley and 2P Anka. But SW1 is more than just a comet. Its orbit, unlike those of most comets, is nearly circular, and lies entirely beyond the orbit of Jupiter. These traits mark SW1 as a centaur, a transitory body between the farther objects of the Kuiper belt and the inner short-period comet population. It is nonetheless still defined as a comet because, about seven times a year, and despite its distance from the sun, it has a sudden grouchy outburst and grows a coma. If an object manages to act like a comet, then it gets called a comet, even if it is already classed as an asteroid. Yes, the terminology is a mess. Welcome to the outer solar system. What makes this not-really-comet discovered all the way back in 1927 so special, the team learned, is where it is. SW1 is the most notable inhabitant of a very specific and consequential region within our solar system, a low eccentricity orbit just beyond Jupiter that the team calls the Gateway. According to their computer models, this region acts as a transitional phase between the Centaur and Jupiter family comet populations, essentially the point between being thrown into the planetary region by Neptune and then being thrown again into the inner solar system by Jupiter. The model predicts that all centaurs will eventually pass through the gateway and become Jupiter family comets. Because no object remains in this region for a substantial amount of time, very few exist within it at any one moment. Although SW1 is the most well known, the team identified two others. At some point in the future, SW1 will catch the eye of Jupiter, who will either fling it back outward or possibly make it one of the largest short period comets in recorded history. Beetlejuice! Beetlejuice! Beetle! Well, it looks like everyone can relax. Whatever fainting spell overtook my favorite star this year, it appears to be recovering. It has doubled in brightness over the last 50 days and looks to be almost back to its usual healthy glow. Of course, if it keeps getting brighter, things may change. Though I hasten to add that even if things start to get radical, we are in no danger. The minimum safe distance from a supernova is about 100 light years, and even though we don't know precisely how far away Betelgeuse is, we can be certain it's nowhere near as close as that. That said, if and when it does go boom, we may have to contend with some increased radiation outside our atmosphere when its expanding nebula finally reaches us 100,000 years later. As before, I've already made a video about this, link in the description, etc., but I thought I'd take this moment to address a few errors that I committed in that video. The first is an error of omission. While it is true, as I said, that the leading hypothesis for Betelgeuse's dimming spell is a cloud of circumstellar dust, another, almost as popular contender is that Betelgeuse may be blemished by a giant sunspot. Sunspots on our sun are just that. Spots. Relatively tiny, localized events, which at most cover 1% of the sun's surface. On giant stars like Betelgeuse, however, sunspots can become so gargantuan that they may spread across a quarter of the star's surface much as suggested in this image. Less a spot than a rash. This would explain why, although Betelgeuse dimmed markedly in visible light, it remained bright at other wavelengths. A second error is my assertion that Betelgeuse was less than half the mass required to become a black hole upon death. While it is true that no star above 25 solar masses will become anything other than a black hole, the boundary between neutron stardom and black holiness is far more broken and ragged than I first suspected, depending on such things as metallicity, i.e. what percentage of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium are in its makeup, as well as the speed of its rotation. 
Beetlejuice may very well collapse into a black hole. Indeed, it may do so so utterly and completely that it never forms a supernova at all. A few minor points. I said that Betelgeuse had the widest angular diameter of any star other than the Sun. That was true, until 1997 when astronomers measured the diameter of the dimmer star R. Doradus and showed that it was, in fact, wider in the sky. Serves me right for not reading the Wikipedia page more closely. Also, I said that 10 to the 3.5 was 5,000. It is, in fact, about 3,000. But if I could do math, I would be doing science instead of writing about it. But there is one particular error that drew me down a path I could never have expected. I said that no true human had ever seen a star go supernova. That is just possibly not true. No one is entirely clear when Homo sapiens first emerged as a species. Recent discoveries in the Sahara have pushed the time of our emergence back to 300,000 years ago. It's likely that future discoveries might push it back even farther which makes the pulsar known as Jaminga a tantalizing prospect. Jaminga was first identified in 1972 as a gamma-ray source in the constellation of Gemini, hence its name, though it also is meant to sound like the Milanese for it's not there. Like all pulsars, Jaminga is a neutron star, the hyperdense corpse of a giant star long since gone supernova. The star that formed Jaminga which is about as far from us as Betelgeuse, exploded 300,000 or so years ago, just when those earliest identified humans died at the foot of the Atlas Mountains. Those first humans would have seen Jaminga's parent star, and they would have seen it explode. One wonders how it affected our myths. In December, an international team using NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope showed that even now, Jaminga may be affecting us more strongly than we realize. Over the last 10 years, the Fermi telescope, as well as the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, a detector on the International Space Station, have detected a surplus of high-energy positrons in the region around Earth. Because positrons get entangled in magnetic fields as they travel through space, it is impossible to trace this excess back to its source. In 2017, a potential source was located by the High Altitude Water Cherenkov Gamma Ray Observatory, or HAWK, basically an array of giant water tanks on top of a four kilometer mountain in Mexico that catches the flare of Cherenkov radiation that occurs whenever a cosmic ray hits a water molecule. It found a halo of ultra high energy light, trillions of times the frequency of visible light, around Jaminga. This halo likely occurs when Jaminga fires waves of positrons and electrons into space at near-relativistic speed. As these waves collide with starlight, they energize it into gamma radiation. But the halos seem too small to account for the excess positrons. But Fermi can observe lower energy than Hawk, and after accounting for all the known gamma ray emissions, the team identified a gigantic rectangular glow of high-energy light centered on Jaminga. If it were visible in our sky, it would be as large as the Big Dipper. It turned out that the lower energy of the gamma ray, the larger the halo, since the longer the ray took to interact with starlight. Jaminga alone may account for 20% of the excess positrons observed. But the hunt is on for other testy pulsars. Jaminga is a reminder. Much of our universe is staring us in the face, but we are simply not evolved to see it. So much universe, so little time. This will need its own video, so on to... A glimpse into the black. As I said, no other science can more radically or more quickly shift your everyday reality than astronomy. Whether it's seeing reflections on the lakes of Titan, or the great red spot on a planet tens of light years away, Astronomy is the present means by which we cross new thresholds, each time irrevocably changing our world. Those children just coming into consciousness now are entering a world in which black holes, long thought to be fantastical, are as perceptible as the stars. By combining eight telescopes across the planet, a team of astronomers effectively gave Earth an eye, allowing it, for the first time, to glimpse a monster at the edges of its world. 
It is somewhat odd that the behemoth supergalaxy listed as M87 has yet to be granted a name. Ten times as massive as our own galaxy, the bloated elliptical is the sun around which the Virgo cluster, a vast collection of galaxies 50 million light years away, revolves, and which is in turn orbited by the Virgo supercluster, of which our meager local group is a distant, forgotten outlier. Even from a distance of 50 million light years, we are still affected by its gravity. In 1953, a massive jet of plasma, 5,000 light years long, was seen erupting from the center of M87, which would one day inspire one of the most epochal images Hubble ever took. That jet, the first relativistic jet ever seen erupting from the center of a galaxy, was determined to be generated by a supermassive black hole at the galaxy's core. This fact would in turn inspire an international team comprising over 200 scientists and engineers and 13 separate participating institutions to select it as the subject of one of the most ambitious portraits in history. And on the 10th of April, after two years of work, that portrait was finally released. The goal of the Event Horizon Telescope wasn't merely to create the first ever image of a black hole. It was to prove Einstein right. General relativity had to date held up against every test humanity could throw at it. But would it crack around a black hole? A black hole is not a physical object. It is a region of space surrounding a point of infinite density called a singularity. Around the singularity, to a distance known as the Schwarzschild radius, is a region of absolute blackness from which no light can escape. The edge of this region is known as the event horizon, and it is usually seen as the rim of a black hole. Since the Schwarzschild radius is dependent on the mass of the singularity, it is often described as the black hole's size. But according to Einstein, well, not him specifically, since he, despite predicting black holes, never accepted they could be real, rays of light outside the event horizon, to a distance of 2.6 Schwarzschild radii, should be sucked into the black hole, creating a shadow 2.6 times larger than the event horizon. The event horizon defines when light cannot escape outward, not when it cannot be pulled in. Even detecting this larger shadow, however, would require resolving an object just 40 microarcseconds in apparent diameter, or a 10 billionth of a degree, the equivalent of spotting an orange on the surface of the moon. At this point, you might well think, why snap the black hole in a galaxy 50 million light years away? Doesn't our own galaxy have a supermassive black hole? And yes. It does. But while our supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, is a fairly impressive size, at 4 million solar masses, its radius is just 22 million kilometers, about half the distance of Mercury from the Sun, and small enough for variations in its output to occur over minutes, far too short for the kind of exposure this particular picture needed. M87 supermassive black hole, by contrast, weighs in at nearly 7 billion solar masses and possesses a Schwarzschild radius of 120 AU, large enough to swallow our entire solar system out to the orbit of Eris with room to spare. For further perspective, from our position, Sagittarius A star has an apparent diameter of 50 microarcseconds, only 10 microarcseconds wider than M87's black hole, despite the former being 20,000 times closer. To take this picture with a conventional telescope would have required a mirror 13,000 kilometers wide, for which a sizable portion of the Earth would have had to have been converted into glass. But the Event Horizon Telescope is far from conventional. A union of eight radio telescopes at a positively Carmen San Diego in range of locations, from Hawaii to Arizona, France and Spain, Mexico and Chile, Greenland and even Antarctica. With each telescope focused on its target from a different location, the light waves came in at different times. When these light waves were combined in a computer and synced with the aid of atomic clocks, they produced an image of equivalent resolution to a single 13,000 kilometer wide mirror. Over the course of four days, the project accumulated a total of four petabytes of data, or about the amount generated by the entire world every two seconds. The data cache was so vast that it couldn't be transmitted electronically. Every hard drive had to be manually delivered from wherever they were in the world, even Antarctica, once summer arrived. There were, however, 
two drawbacks with this image. First, it still had only the total amount of light from each of the eight telescopes, meaning that, while high resolution, it would be dark. And second, with only eight telescopes, the image would be riddled with gaps, which would need to be filled in with computer algorithms, reducing petabytes to mere megabytes. Luckily, radio astronomy has been dealing with this problem for years, and has a number of tried and true techniques for filling in the blanks. When combined with a number of newer, less tested techniques to act as controls, four candidate images were ultimately produced, each consistent with the available data. While each was slightly different, they all nonetheless revealed what the mission had sought to find, a shadow 2.6 Schwarzschild radii from the event horizon. The final image was a composite of the four, updated with newer, better quality data. Incidentally, the image also verified another prediction that the accretion disks around black holes spin so close to the speed of light that the Doppler effect brightens the nearer side. Well, that was 2019, finally put to bed. Four months late. I apologize yet again to my ever-patient viewers for this delay. For some reason, compiling this list gave me a serious case of information overload. As you may have noted, I couldn't even fit all the entries into one video. But don't worry, that video is coming next after which I may draw on some other information I gathered whilst researching this. 2020 looks to be a tough year for all of us. I hope I can help to make it a little brighter.